The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 14th chapter. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know how many wrestling fans we have here today. Would anybody admit? Are they? Who, anybody wrestle in school? Couple hands. Anybody watch WWF? What? You won't admit to that? I, I, somehow, somehow I feel like saying, let's get ready to rumble. Somehow that just seems to fit today. Jacob had just crossed the Jabbok River with his wives and his family on the way back to the land that he had fled some 20 years earlier. But this was a crossing that was about more than geography. It was a crossing, a crossroad moment in his life. He was going back to a land, back to a family that he had left after deceiving them, after cheating them, specifically his brother lying to his dad in order to get the birthright and the blessing that rightly belonged to his brother Esau. He was heading back to the land that had been promised to his grandfather Abraham and to his father Isaac. And now it was time to go back. God had directed him back. But to come back would mean that he would have to face the music. He would have to face his brother. And so left alone that night, he wrestled with a man who came upon him, a man who he apparently could not see, and they wrestled throughout the night. Who was it that Jacob wrestled with that night? Maybe, maybe he was wrestling with himself, with the past deeds that he had done with the ways that he had fallen short, with the corners that he had cut. Maybe he wrestled with himself because he knew that he wasn't the man of integrity that he ought to be. That kind of stuff weighs on a person and makes you wrestle within. Maybe he was wrestling with himself that night. Or maybe he was wrestling with his brother Esau, the one he was about to meet the next day. Because remember, to get to that land, he was going to have to first meet his brother Esau, the one he had cheated. And he was afraid of that brother, afraid of his anger, afraid of his potential vengeance. So maybe he was wrestling with that brother in his mind. Maybe you do what, what I do sometimes. I, I, I think about uh, somebody that I know I need to have a conversation with, and I play the whole conversation in my mind. I think about what I'm going to say, and then I think about what they're going to say, and then I think about what my response is going to be. And does anybody else do this? There were a lot of people at Saturday night that admitted to it. But I play out the whole conversation in my own mind without ever really letting the other person engage. I, I've got the whole thing figured out. And usually I get really riled up when I do it. So maybe that's what Jacob was wrestling with that night. He was wrestling 
with his brother, at least in his mind, in the conversation about what would happen the next day when they would meet after 20 years. Or maybe he was wrestling with God. That's what the text seems to indicate by the time we get toward the end of the story. Yes, he was wrestling with God. Wrestling with God at this crossroad moment of his life, knowing everything that he had done, and knowing how God had been faithful to him throughout all of these years, knowing that he was unworthy of this God, who had blessed him by getting him safely away when there was trouble 20 years earlier, blessed him by settling him in a land where he could take wives and have children and, and build a life for himself. So much blessing he had received, and he knew he didn't deserve it, yet he had it. And he knew the next morning that he was going to meet that brother. And he didn't know what was ahead of him. And he was fighting with God, wrestling with God, because he desperately knew he needed a blessing. He wanted a blessing. He insisted on a blessing. As they wrestled through the night... It drew close to morning, and the man, God, wanted Jacob to let go of him, because all through the night, neither one of them had prevailed over the other, which is an interesting topic in and of itself, right? Somehow God must have not really wanted to prevail, right? It must not have really been about a, a victory, having your hand raised, because certainly the God of creation could pin little old Jacob. But God stayed in that match, and through the night neither one of them had prevailed. But as morning began to dawn, God wanted Jacob to let go of him. But Jacob wouldn't let go. He said, I will not let go until you bless me. Jacob needed a blessing for that day. And God did it. God blessed him. And he gave him a new name, Israel. Jacob wouldn't tap out in his wrestling match with God. You know, there may be times when we would like to tap out, give up, Say, I don't deserve a blessing, or I don't think I can get a blessing, or what I'm facing is just too hard, or my, my, my past is too checkered, my future too uncertain, I can't possibly see a good ending to this, and we'd rather just tap out. There are moments, there are moments, but there's something in this story that tells us to listen to Jacob and to watch what he does. And there is something in this story that we learn from God. A God who is willing to stay on the mat with us. A God who is not willing to let us go without giving a blessing. A God who will give us a new name and a new beginning. When I was a kid, I remember watching a TV show called Dragnet. I'm sure it was reruns because I'm much too young <laughs> for the originals. Somebody walked out last night and said, I listen to Dragnet on the radio. <laughs> I've heard of radios. But I watched this show called Dragnet. It was one of the early police shows. And there was a phrase that the narrator always said, because supposedly these were kind of based on true stories, but the narrator always said, names have been changed to protect the innocent. In Dragnet, that's how it worked. But in the Bible, that's not why names are changed. Names are not changed in Scripture. God doesn't give a new name to protect the innocent, but God gives new names to set people free for a new beginning. And that's what God did for Jacob. I, I mean Israel. 
that day. I love what happens in the story after the wrestling match. After Jacob realizes that he is now Israel and that there is a new beginning before him because of the blessing that God has given him. You need to go home and read chapter 33. You need to go home and remember what happens. It's a beautiful scene because Jacob, uh, Israel, goes into that new day and he sees his brother Esau coming at him with 400 men. Generally, if 400 men are coming at me, I don't think that's a good thing. <laughs> Women, too. I, 400 is a big number. It seems kind of threatening. And in a scene that is reminiscent of the father running out to meet the prodigal son, Esau runs out to meet Israel. He embraces him. He kisses him. And together, they weep. Surprising grace. Surprising in the midst of a situation that surely Jacob did not deserve, but God delivered mercy, grace, a new beginning, and the continuation of the promise. Two weeks ago when we started this journey into the narrative lectionary, we started with Genesis 2 with the second creation story. And we talked about how in creation we realize that we're connected, connected to one another, connected to creation in ways that we can't even imagine. And then last week we saw how that, that connection takes shape as God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah that their descendants would be as numerous as the stars in heaven and that they would be a blessing to the nations. And that that started with the unlikely promise of a son in their very old age, Isaac. And now Isaac's son, Jacob, is there to continue the promise, to continue the plan that God has, even through a scoundrel like Jacob, God delivers on his promise. You see, because God will not let our broken selves get in the way of promise. God will not let our broken selves get in the way of blessing. God will persevere and deliver. And God will be present at our crossroad moments when we are standing in those places that have broken us in some way. Whether because of what has happened to us or because of things that we have brought on ourselves. God stands at those moments when we are passing from one thing to another, from the past to the future, from the, unknown, from the known to the unknown. When we don't know how things are going to play out and we are afraid and worried. And when we doubt whether we deserve a blessing at all. God meets us there. Comes to wrestle with us through those tough moments of life. And to give us a blessing that will set us free to move ahead. It was true for Jacob. And for those who would follow in the biblical narrative, watch for it in all the stories that follow. Because this, this same thing will happen again. God will work through scoundrels and troublemakers and doubters. 